Okay, now we will move on to the last session of the workshop. And this talk will be given by David Hardy from Beckman Institute at UIUC. And he's going to be talking about multi level summation method for calculating electrostatic interactions in NAMD. Well, um, thank you, first of all, very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present this work. Um, so, when we're doing molecular dynamics, we're integrating Newton's equations of motion uh, for billions of time steps, and there's really not uh, parallelism across steps. We have to get all of our parallelism within each step, and uh, most of the computation that we have to do uh, requires this uh, evaluation of the potential and then the uh, uh, negative gradient of the potential, which uh, gives us the forces. And um, uh, in, in particular, um, we're concerned with the Coulomb portion that I've uh, shown there. Uh, the motivation for this work is the need to accurately represent the electrostatic interactions. And so since this has a long range component that can't be ignored, it requires a fast method. And we, uh, this is usually done using the particle mesh AWOLD method, but PME has two shortcomings. It requires periodic boundary conditions, and it poses a bottleneck to parallel scalability. Now, uh, this multi-level summation method overcomes both of these shortcomings. So, uh, let me talk about some of the best features of MSM. It supports periodic boundaries like PME, and it also supports non-periodic boundaries. So, for example, uh, doing a protein folding in a water droplet, and it uh, supports semi-periodic boundaries. And this could be in one dimension or it could be in two dimensions. Uh, but the, the most compelling application we found here is uh, two dimensional uh, periodicity where we're looking at a membrane channel. And so this, this turns out to, you know, uh, there are certain problems here in which uh, we can't really apply PME to just a single membrane channel. So, um, uh, for instance, if you have a, a, a different charge distribution um, that you want to have, uh, uh, say, on either side of the membrane, um, this would require doubling the size of the system and creating a, a, a pocket where you have one type of uh, charge distribution in, in one region of, of space and then, then another charge distribution. Um, however, uh, using a, a a non-periodic uh, dimension uh, in the, the z direction, um, we, we can actually uh, model this with just a single membrane channel using MSM. Uh, furthermore, MSM offers better parallel scaling through uh, uh, its hierarchical structure, uh, since it does not need to calculate the FFT. And the uh, arithmetic intensity and localized memory access is makes it well suited to modern hardware, so CPU vector instructions and GPUs. So uh, just looking at a comparison uh, of MSM with certain aspects of PME, um, since PME requires a calculation of two 3D FFTs, um, uh, well, uh, it poses a problem due to just the memory access itself being really scattered whenever you're trying to calculate uh, even a, a single FFT. But in this case, uh, for a 3D FFT, what we're really doing is we're calculating 1D FFTs uh, across each face or, or each pair of faces of, of the um, system cell. Uh, so uh, the, the parallel communication uh, of PME uh, it, Really, it becomes a many-to-many -many, uh, communication where you're essentially doing what resembles a matrix transpose, uh, whereas MSM has a tree-like structure with a, a reduction and an expansion. And so you can also 
um, think about uh, the difference here in terms of the bisection bandwidth, where uh, for PME, you basically need to uh, uh, co communicate like a full nth's worth of data uh, across uh, your P to the two-thirds face of processors when you think in terms of just, you know, that theoretical division in your, your computer. Uh, whereas with MSM, it's really just a fixed width. So uh, MSM uh, gives you something that is, is actually, you know, uh, able to scale the problem size with the processors. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how MSM does its calculation. Um, it uh, imposes a splitting of the interaction potential. So we take this uh, 1 over R potential and we split it into a uh, short range part that's calculated uh, between pairs of atoms. And then we do further splittings of longer and longer portions so that the, the total adds up to this 1 over R. And each of these uh, longer parts is truncated at cutoff distances of 2A and 4A and 8A and so on. And then each of these um, uh, more slowly varying parts are going to be interpolated from grids of spacing H and 2H and 4H and so on at up to whatever you need to resolve the particular size problem that you're working on. And furthermore, we do a nesting of the approximation between the levels. Okay, so instead of just interpolating directly from the atoms to each level of the grid, what we're doing is we're interpolating uh, through all the intermediate levels. And this is what gives us an order in algorithm. So I'm going to skip some of the math slides here and move on to um, a diagram of the computation. So just to recap, uh, so the force is calculated here as the sum of an exact short range part plus an interpolated long range part. And uh, we can uh, represent the computational steps in this, this diagram here below where we start with positions and charges here on, on the bottom left hand side. And we've got a short range interaction part that we're calculating to get a short range contribution to the forces. And we have a long range part that we're calculating first by um, spreading the charges to uh, uh, a grid of spacing H. And then, then at this level, we're left with uh, evaluating that particular uh, solely varying kernel, okay, that part of the 1 over R uh, potential there uh, on the H grid. And we also do a, an operation that looks just like a multi grid restriction to spread the charges further to the 2H grid and then up to the 4H grid and so on. And so at each of these intermediate levels here, we're doing uh, uh, what is essentially a evaluating a, a truncated kernel there at on the H grid and then another one on the 2H grid, another one on the 4H grid and so on to get partial sums of potentials on the right hand side of the diagram. And then we've got a prolongation step again just like you would in a multi-grid method um, where you are summing the uh, course um, contributions from the 4H grid down to the 2H grid and down to the H grid and so on. And finally, you've got a final step that's uh, referred to as interpolation uh, that, that finally gives you uh, forces at your atoms. Okay, so we're putting this into NAMD. And so by doing this, we can take advantage of the infrastructure that NAMD already provides, which is an efficient uh, calculation of the short range part of the forces. And um, so here I'm just reminding everybody that NAMD uh, uses this hybrid decomposition. Uh, it's, it's hybrid as a spatial work decomposition. 
so that uh, we've uh, decomposed the atoms spatially into patches, and we've decomposed the work into these uh, compute objects that all can be scheduled concurrently. And um, so uh, the, the idea is that um, then at some patch here that's depicted in the center, we are basically sending our um, pos atom positions and charges to these purple objects here, which are the compute objects. Okay, so this is an example of the over decomposition that um, is, is good for our problems to make use of when we're using charm plus plus. Um, so the, the most computationally intensive part of the long range part are these, these gridded calculations that we're doing across each level of that computational diagram that I just showed you. So um, uh, what, what we're doing here, we can, um, uh, the nice way to think about this mathematically is that we're calculating the potential at each point here on the grid and uh, the potential is given by taking a weighted sum of charges that's, you know, surrounding each, each potential. So this is essentially uh, a gather style operation. Now, we don't actually have to do this, you know, type of calculation strictly as gathers. We can, we can do the sums in, in any order. So we could turn this whole thing around. We could think of this as I've got a charge in the center and I'm calculating some contribution of myself, some weighted contribution of my charge to all the points around me to, to present, to uh, uh, contribute some uh, uh, contribution to that potential for that point. And so that's exactly the way we want to calculate this using charm plus plus. So, um, so what we can do here is use a similar decomposition strategy for these, for, for the, the work that's being done on the grids. And so we've got grid blocks. We've decomposed the, the grids into blocks. And then we are uh, also have a work decomposition where we are um, uh, scheduling these, these block computes. And so uh, the idea now is that I've turned this into um, this, this gather operation to a scatter operation where I'm taking all the charges here on my grid block and I'm sending that to each of these purple diamonds here that are the block computes and they're going to be calculating the potential contributions to my neighboring blocks around me. So, um, the expression of this in charm plus plus is pretty straightforward. The idea is that we uh, have a 3D char array of grid blocks, one per level, and we perform, uh, for each of these grid blocks, it's going to perform uh, restriction and prolongation to its some 2H cover that's just local to that block. And it's then going to send charges up to uh, to the block computes that are up, up on the next level. And later it's, uh, oh, and it, it's also going to send charges uh, across to the block computes, which are stored, which we're going to just store in a 1D char array. So the idea is that um, each of these uh, 3D grid blocks here is going to um, have several block computes that it will send to that will calculate part of these uh, potential contributions and then send those on to the particular uh, uh, blocks that, that are affected by that, that calculation. And uh, so then the block will later be receiving partial potentials both from above and also from the block computes from its neighbors. So uh, also, we're going to associate an object with each NAMBI patch to perform the interpolation and interpolation 
And again, this is done locally with just, you know, kind of a what, whatever portion of the grid block surrounds that patch. And uh, it's, it's a similar operation. The interpolation is that charge spreading. Uh, and then we will be sending that on up to the first level uh, blocks. And later, we're going to be receiving potentials back into a potential grid covering that we'll calculate our interpolation from. So just some quick charm plus plus coding paradigms here um, that, that are involved with this. The idea is that we'll have these things that will look, you know, like entry methods here. We're, we're going to be getting parts of you know, some subgrid, and then we're going to add that subgrid into the grid that we're holding. And as we're receiving parts of these grids, we've just got a counter, and we know that we're receiving some number of contributions that's, you know, known in advance. And, and when we receive all our contributions, we'll go ahead and compute the restriction and uh, send the charge up and, and also then send the charge across. And uh, I just wanted to list this part here, too, and, and that is that this is the most compelling use I've ever seen of multiple inheritance in scientific computing. Um, and and it's, it's nice. It's a way of being able to sort of keep the charm plus plus and communication portion of it, you know, uh, kind of separate from all the code that's going to do the calculation. So I, I, I think this is... This is uh, maybe a nice way to express things here. Okay, so the question is just, just implementing just the 3D uh, uh, chars for each level and, and uh, this 1D uh, array uh, of chars for the compute blocks, um, is this gonna give us good performance? And well, okay, it, it does parallelize the problem and it solves it correctly. But it gives lousy performance if we just naively just throw that, you know, at the, uh, the compiler. And that's really because, uh, you know, if, if, you know, Charm++ doesn't know any better, it's just going to go ahead and schedule each of these uh, uh, arrays starting with core zero and just, just assign everything sequentially. But it means that we have this terrible load of balance. And so uh, to get... You know, decent performance, we've got to do some sort of load balancing. So I uh, chose to do, you know, a reasonable static load balancing here, which is to distribute the grid blocks evenly among the nodes, as evenly as possible across the, the nodes, and then assign the block computes to either a sender or a receiver node, so as to try to minimize the internode communication. And each node then distributes the block computes, compute objects that gets evenly among its cores. And finally, the other optimization I did was to uh, optimize the critical path that's being taken here in the problem, uh, in, in, in the computation. And so the idea is that we can assign message priorities to, to these, you know, pieces of, of or these subgrids that are being sent around. And um, we, can, we can use these message priorities to try and um, design the system to calculate, you know, things, you know, as quickly as possible across the critical path, which is basically just, you know, everything that's done up to the top and then coming down the other end. So that's, that's what was done. And um, so we have some scaling results. Um, and, you know, in, in, in certain cases, uh, MSM uh, did show um, um, good scaling compared to PME. So here is uh, one of those cases. Um, and, and this was uh, strong scaling on the classic APOA1 benchmark uh, on these uh, Cray XC6 uh, Blue Waters hardware um, cores. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, so in this test case, uh, PME just, you know, drops off eventually. It's, it's, you know, not able to scale 
Um, some of the things that impacted this, this version of MSM scaling right here was not really handling the work at the very top of the grid a hierarchy as well as, as could have been done. And so um, I've got some, some um, uh, improvements that, that I'm, I'll soon be implementing or finish implementing into NAMD um, that, that will hopefully take care of some of the latencies that we saw whenever we had kind of a vanishing number of, of uh, grid points. But, you know, I ended up, you know, just doing kind of a simple-minded approach of spawning off too much work at the top. And, and then everybody was left waiting as a result. Okay, so some more recent uh, advances uh, are, have been uh, the use of B-spline interpolation. And so this turns out to improve accuracy by an order of magnitude for the same computational effort. Uh, but the uh, problem is that it's more expensive to calculate the stencils. And um, a, uh, a performance uh, advance is the use, the explicit use of CPU vectorization. Uh, and, and this improves single core performance uh, quite well. Um, however, it does require uh, quite a bit of data reorganization. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the second point here. So um, uh, the idea is really just to cluster the grid points. And uh, so um, it, instead of traversing the grid sort of the normal way, we, we cluster uh, the points into cubes of, of eight grid points apiece. And then we arrange the, the calculation so that it's just, uh, instead of just doing, uh, you know, the straight on 3D convolution, you know, that basically looks like six nested loops, uh, well, we're, we're still doing that, but we're, now we're, you know, um, doing these matrix vector products. And, and so this turns out to give uh, a lot of uh, performance improvement. It's, it's shown in, in a single course de test to give like uh, seven times improvement over the non-vector version. Okay, so I'm not really going to talk about the B-spline issues, but uh, I'll uh, end on... Uh, this performance comparison of multi-level summation with a uh, fast multiple method. And so uh, the idea here is I'm um, calculating uh, time in seconds versus the relative error in, in mass weighted force. And uh, so, so the blue stuff here is MSM and everything this way in the graph is, is better. And uh, for FMM, um, this particular code only allowed two choices. It allowed a choice of either uh, nine terms in the multiple expansion or 18 terms in the multiple expansion. So that's why there's really only two points there represented for uh, FMM. And we're getting a lot of MSM points because uh, what we're varying here is we're varying the, um, the uh, cutoff distance, the, the initial cutoff distance. And if you do the analysis, it turns out that that becomes the, the control of uh, your performance versus accuracy. And, uh, and um, so, and, and the points uh, really are showing the optimal results of uh, different uh, orders of uh, interpolation here using the beast ones. And, uh, so anyway, that's a, that's a line connecting all of those, and it's actually taken over uh, several runs where you know we've calculated everything with error bars. It's it's, it's very evident in the, the right hand graph that's that's comparing the um, the uh, error and potential. Energy. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, um, we're we're quite pleased about these results. And uh, so going forward, uh, I'll be finishing the implementation of, of the, both the B-spline and the, the clustering into uh, the NAMD implementation. So um, that will be essentially uh, 
multi-level summation version two. So anyway, I want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators, um, uh, Robert Skeel from Purdue, and uh, Zhao Wu is a, a postdoc in the um, research group here in Beckman. Uh, Jim and John are the three developers of NAMD and BMD, respectively, and uh, are fine with me. So, thank you. So, in um, the 7x speedup you got from uh, explicitly vectorizing uh, the kernel computation, yes. um, do you have any idea if most of that came from? Uh, the better cache utilization due to the reorganization of the code, um, or if most of that actually came from the the increase in vector width. I haven't really measured between the two, um, so it's it's hard to say. But I mean, it, I'm 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 sure. My my guess is that most of it came from the fact that I'm just using. Know, the CPU more effectively for you know critical operations here because that you know and and so it wasn't just the um, grid calculations that that used the vectorization. I actually wrote a fast vector version of the short range calculation too, and, and so it's it's measuring all of that. So. Oh, okay. okay. Any other questions? The um, yeah yeah the one sort of a smallish or medium I guess small nowadays used to be medium APOA one result. Uh, do you have a sense of, of how it performs for larger benchmarks? Um, it, we we did do a test here for a, a larger benchmark that uh, it didn't scale as well on, and I think that was due to two things. Uh, one is, you know, the, the issue with the top of the grid hierarchy. Another issue is probably with the uh, static load balancing because it doesn't really take into account the distance of any of these things from the patches initially. And, and so since it could be scattering these things wherever, you know, I, I think that, that has something to do as well. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker again.